All right, we just got to uh, Pebble Beach for the show. Really great place. Um, we're going to do a docent tour. So my goal is is to not have me talk the whole time, but to listen to another expert that's going to talk about some cars as we walk through uh, through the show field. So, what I want to suggest we do, we'll go for the, we'll go on the walk, and then you can take and sort of get, get a handle on what the walk looks like, and then come back and then go and look and talk to the, the owner. Let me tell you something. The owners are more interested in talking about their cars than almost any, they didn't come here to stare at the wall. They came here to talk to people. So all of that stuff is is worthwhile. The the fact that we're all together, there's a whole bunch of us. Uh, you're you're allowed to and encouraged to yell at me and say talk louder, okay? What is your name? Bruce is my Bruce Jr. And talk I'm, louder. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> that worked. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, and 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 my only claim to fame and why I'm here is I I came here in 1955. I'm 90 years old and my my children are all thinking I'm nuts. So <laughs> I I spent some time with with Dan Gurney and Carol Shelby. In, in the 60s. So I, I have some authentic background in the motor racing game, and, and I spent most of my life making things. So I'm always fascinated, and I'm always over intrigued by the gadgets. I mean, you're gonna see so many cars with so many gadgets, and you're gonna go, what's that? What's that? I mean, th these cars up here, that they, they're full of gadgets. I mean, they've got three spark plugs on the on the cylinder head, three, three plug cylinder heads. So anyway, and I'm not prepared to answer all those questions, but but you know, I can answer some. I'll ask you. Anyway. Right. So yeah, ask anyway. You know, and the answer is I don't know, and that <laughs> you just have to put up with that. Well, let's yeah. go. So so if somebody's going to be at the tail end, and I'm going to ask them if they would kind of hey, keep moving, keep moving. So that's okay. what we got to do. We got to okay. keep moving because okay. we we'll got to get you guys you. through here in an hour. Okay. And, and so okay, so let's go down. We know that Lincoln. Is, is the sponsoring thing. You'll see a lot of Lincolns along here, and then you'll see a lot of other stuff. I'm going to try to get with you and say to you, here's Duesenberg, here's Ferraris, here's these things. It's kind of up to you to say, what's a Ferrari? Or, or do I know? <laughs> Please don't no ask that question. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. The only thing I'm not going to listen to is people say talk up when they don't mean it. That's right. Okay. Okay. So, onward. <laughs> You're my star today, just so you know. Okay, okay. <laughs> boy, oh boy. <laughs> the camera damage is going to be widespread before all that. Anyway, so this first row is the Lincoln guys, and, and Ford Ford Motor Company, Lincoln Division is sponsoring this event here. So we'll do that. So what we're going to see is a collection of Lincolns, mostly older cars, and they're, they're full of fascinating stuff. And lots of, you know, wooden wheels. Why did they have wooden wheels? Because wood has infinite fatigue life and it won't wear, break. You know, it properly loaded. Well, and metal, they were afraid of metal wheels. Early on. So you see a lot of wooden wheels and they crank and they make kind of straight joints. Okay. It was all that, so. So at. As you walk along, you'll see Most signs uh, on, the, on the ground that will describe who the owner is and, and tell you a little bit about the cars. <laughs> the tough part, the tough part of all of this is we're, we're looking at both sides. That, that, that makes it tougher than we could, we've got Lincoln's on display on this side, we've got other Lincoln's on display on this side, and we're going to have that problem all the way down, as far as on both sides. So your, your job is to keep your eyes on and turn your head. Somebody asked me about the ribbons on the cars. The, the ribbons, 
Okay, are we, are we still hanging together? The ribbons? Okay. I, I, the, the ribbon, you see ribbons on the floor. They've already been in some other event and got a, a prize at that other event. So that's typically, and somebody will find a ribbon and they'll say, no, that's not true. But basically what they've done is they've won a ribbon at some other event around town. And there's a bunch of stuff going on all the time. So the whole week is devoted to this stuff. So. Are you, really nice. you guys doing okay? You're doing great. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Okay, well. You'll also see some cars like like that one up over there. That, of course, that car is, is, is worthy of being. I think that's it. The only time you see a car that looks like it ought to be in the junkyard, it's probably a restoration car, which means that it is, it is then judged to be original, meaning it's just like it rolled out of the garage 35 years ago. And, and what's happening is somebody has kept it in that, that condition. So you see, and you know, it's, it, there's no good way to describe it, but they get prizes for restoration. For, for having a car that is unrestored but still survives. And fascinating sorts of things. The open back end of the car, a touring car, or a, you know, a special car for somebody, the president of the university. Well, we're seeing Lincolns all the way along. So Lincolns Beautiful. on this side, Lincolns on this side. Any questions so far? No? Okay. Doing great. Okay, this, this is worthy of a moment. This is a Continental. Uh, the, the, arguably, this is, I believe, I would say, this is the second model of the Lincoln Continental. And when it comes to the first one, I'll point that out too. But this was a, I want to say this is about a 1948 version. They went on to build other cars with, other cars have taken that name, but Ford uh, had the name Continental, they trademarked the name Continental. So they, and this was a premium product car, powered by a V12 engine. <laughs> um, what? Well, take a look at this car here, this dark blue car, and you'll notice the doors open like this. And that's that's left over from an old era. But one time I talked to a guy who designed cars and I said, gee, why did, that seems dangerous. And he said, it is. But he said, it's so much easier to get in the car, particularly these two-seater cars. It's, either, it's much easier to get into that car when the doors open that way than it is when you open the other way. He said, you got to crawl in. And, he, and I and I said something that sounds like some wife some wife advice that you got. And he said, uh, actually, you're right. <laughs> so anyway, that's, and and you'll see on these cars they have a this car for example has a roof that's removable on the front. So the chauffeur the chauffeur got to sit in the outdoors and the and the passengers got to sit in the indoors. That was kind of the way that worked. So that okay. S kind of curve is that a hinge? Those are called Landau irons, and in, in, in long ago, those 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 things collapsed. They they folded kind of like this. That uh -huh. center point moved in, and what happened was that then the roof would come back, and you'd see the roof kind of packed up in the back end. And and but they also became decorations. Okay. So the functional part was they helped keep the top and all that stuff when the top the top was down. And, and I wouldn't want to bet a lot of money that that top doesn't come down. I was, yeah, it I, says non-collapsible. Does that? Okay. Well, hmm. see. So that, that shows you the brilliance of the tour guides. <laughs> <laughs> now we're seeing, we're seeing this is, this is a, a dedicated section to Lincoln. Obviously they're all Lincoln. Type 50 something got it. The nifty part about what you see here is the fact that each, 
All of these cars were Lincoln. They were probably all premium price cars. They were all probably most likely were all custom made uh, uh, bodies. In other words, they bought a chassis from Ford. They arranged for a chassis from Ford to go to a body builder who then uh, built build a body to their specs. So, that, and you'll see quite a bit of that. And, uh, the, Okay, so we keep moving. Now, uh, all those the, 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 you're, at, at the risk of being a pain in the butt, I, I, you're supposed to ask the questions to me because that's what I'm supposed to do. If you ask your answer, ask these guys questions, then it steals the thunder. Well, I was going to just—I was yes. just remarking that that foot, the running board, looks very different than a lot of them. Right. That are completely well, parallel. More than likely, more than likely, somebody said that door opens this way, uh -huh. so I don't need a running board up here behind the car, and I don't want a running board on the car. So they just did it. the styling cue was to say, okay, fine. You pull the door open. And look at the size of the door. It's huge. It's, it's huge. mammoth, see. So, so when you take a look at the doors on the car just ahead of it, you'll notice that the doors open backwards. So people could back into the seat and sit down and presto. So that was that was so. And you'll on see the that custom bodies with those trademark. No, well, anyway? the, the the custom body business range from Detroit and New York to California. There was companies all over the country who made, not all over the country, but in special places that made bodies. Some of them were were standard body design for a company. Some of them were special. You went down, you wanted, I want a special foot thing or something like that. You could get that. Some companies wound up only building the complete body. Some companies built custom things for you, whatever you want. Oh. So it's kind of a, and remember, now, much of this stuff happened in the period from 1928 to about 1935, and, and the country was upside down. Mm -hmm. So there was, you know, there was a lot of opportunity for people to build things, and you could get a little bit of work done for not too much money. So that played into it, too. And, of course, there was no standards. We had no, no, no laws about this, that, and the other thing. So that was another. Safety was not a consideration. Well, you know, we don't know. Another hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it, the, the, I think the, the, it's fair to say, I think it's fair to say that if you take a look at a car like this, you can see that this was a Lincoln called a Murphy Roadster. It was a, the, Murph, the body was built by Murphy, and, which was a, one of those bodybuilding companies. Mm -hmm. And... You look at the work, and although these cars have been really, really tuned up, that you'll also see that underneath all of that, and when that car was new, it had to be a pretty nicely done job. And, and so that was what we got. The lady in the back who is short with the hat, are you hearing okay? Are you hearing enough? Maybe that's what I should say. You're hearing okay. You're doing great. You're doing good. Oh, you're good. Uh, no, I think it's fair to say the answer is no. Some of them, the answer is yes, but but most of them, the answer. Is no. And and part of that is the reason that the styles and the things change. But also, you can't mix some of these colors anymore. The the, the environmental regulations have gotten into the middle of it, and, and that's part of the problem. Not the only problem, but just part of the problem. Uh, anyway, here, this is here, this is a convertible sedan. And, and by that I mean it's a it's a it's a weather it's a weather tight car, whereas some of these cars had side curtains and things like that, and they weren't weather tight. Their water would come in, and any anybody that's over 50 recognized the fact that you know you you rode around and it was cool to do that. People who were older than that didn't want to do that. And uh, mm. so the yes. RJM, what does that stand for? Owner of the car. Oh. Oh, yeah, that would make sense. I can't find the name of it, but yeah, that would typically be it. That makes sense. Yeah, and, 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 and the body on this car, the body on this car looks to me like it was a, a, a special manufactured body, custom, custom body, custom, custom coat. Okay. <clears throat> Sponsor. Thank you. Thank you. And it's, yeah, I think it's fair to say that Lincoln, Lincoln, the car company built, they built big cars, but they were, they tried to be not too ostentatious. And do I, is that true? 
And there's Wayne. Is that his car? Pardon? Is yeah. He he's a prominent restorer of cars and he is a builder and this is his car, so this is his time in the sun. Mm -hmm. And you know, I wouldn't Kareem. Green Kareem. Yeah, his own T V show. Mm -hmm. And he, he he does this stuff and there's you know, he has a following of people who you know I mean, they say, Wayne's here, and the next yeah. thing you know, everybody's over there. Yes. And, and he has his own story to tell. Yes. It's his story, and he can tell you to listen if you want. It's just, it's too crammed in here. Let's go to where it's not crammed, okay? okay. We're gonna clear. This is this is the Lincoln Continental, 1939. Probably, probably the the biggest. I would guess this was the biggest to do in the Ford Motor Company family up until that time, because Henry Ford. And by that time, had sort of passed as a as a the manager of the company. The family was in some turmoil. The war was beginning to approach. Things were happening, and so Edsel Ford was the sort of the brains behind the development of the of this car. Different style, different look, different everything. And if you read the books, I don't know. If you read the books about the Ford family, that was about the time that Henry Henry Number One had sort of lost, beginning to lose it. So they wanted to, they wanted to build a new car. They wanted to get some. And he was, he, Henry, was, was not in the design business much because his ideas about building cars was pretty simple. This was a styling thing by Edsel. And, and, and then you look, take a look, this was the first one. And they built essentially two models of the Continental before the, the war sort of took over. And this is the first one. Well, they, this is very, very styled for that time. The, the other one is a little more, has more, it's still got the back end, but the front end was different. And we'll see one of those before we get done here. So bumper to bumper, are they about Well, the okay. answer to that question is no. The, 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 the wheelbase is kind of what governed the car. But, but all that was driven by the fact that, you know, I've got four people I want to put in the car. And, and how much more room do the four people want? And, and, and that, you, you, got to the, you got into the chauffeur-driven cars and that kind of stuff. But, but essentially, there was a, you needed room in the back seat for four people or two people, and you needed room in the front seat for two people. So that pretty much dictated how long the car, that and the engine and a few other things, dictated how big the car was. That help? Yeah. Thank you. And, and, there's, you know, the, and the other thing was that this was a, this is a convertible, so you had to provide room for the people in the back seat. Mm -hmm. So this was a two-door car, and that was clearly, a, you know, that was, that was unconventional style at times. So, you know, I can remember, I can remember conversations when I was tiny and we talked about, you know, wish we had the car was bigger in the back. Yeah. Sorry, sir. Okay, and then we've got Packard, we've now got Sport Deluxe and Crust. Packard is predominantly here. You'll see a lot of this. Packard was a company that you bought the car, often you bought the car, and then you had a body built for it, as compared to conventional, like a Ford car where you bought a, you bought a Ford, and, uh, or even Lincoln. And it came in a, in a certain package, in a certain style. But Packards were... Not all, but most Packards were in a thing where you'd go down and order the body. Or you go to the dealer, and the dealer would arrange for you to get, we've got this body and this body, and we deal with the various coaches. So, so it was a significant custom component to it, and everybody was sort of trying to figure out what it was. Remember that in those days, in the 20s and the early 30s, the cars were displayed not so much in dealerships as they were displayed in hotel lobbies and places like that. 
uh, or a train depots. They would have a display of the new Packards or the new Fords and, and that sort of stuff. Biltmore Hotel in downtown LA was a favorite place in LA for doing that kind of stuff. So, you know, a, a lot of things changed. The war came along, a lot of things changed during the war. And so then we started again after 1946 with, with a whole new breed of stuff. And, you know, and not many people here remember that, but I did. <laughs> and, you know, it's, so it was, but it was, it was pretty staggering. And, and, and so, and what we see is most of the stuff we've looked at so far is all pre-war. This is, none, none of this stuff is post-war. In fact, I would say that we, we won't see, we won't see post-war passenger cars much here. Passenger cars. We'll see race cars, we'll see specialty cars, we'll see a lot of things like that. And, and all fascinating. And I would also point out that most of the cars, if we drew a line in 1946, if you went backwards, most of the cars won't have paint jobs nearly as dramatic as the paint jobs we have here. I mean, turn around and look at that orange car with the black trim on the but it, you know, it looks great. We like it. <coughs> and I think, it works. okay. Mostly, mostly Packards on this side, and then specialty Euro European cars here on this side. I want, you to, I want you to take a look at this blue car here, just for, for laughs and giggles, but take a look at the blue car. Visualize yourself jumping in this car, and driving in the no windows, the heater doesn't work very well, and, you're, and, and, and it's summer, right? It's summer. And so, does that mean, you know, we're not, I'm not talking about 2022, I'm talking about 1936. You know, I'm saying to you, okay, would you like that? I think I'd rather have the one with the windows that are all rolled up. So, so roll up windows on a convertible car were a, a, you know, that was a big deal. Some people are, are, can reflect on all that, remember that. Okay. Okay, we're gonna move. We're, we're gonna move from. We're gonna move from Packards, which are generally speaking one of the premium grade cars in in volume in the United States, and we're gonna move to Duesenbergs, which were arguably the best thing that America built in volume. The Duesenberg brothers were. They, 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 they kept building more and more powerful cars and they were super performers and, and of course they wound up with Hollywood movie stars driving their cars. So um, Packards are here, Duesenbergs are down here. And, and all of them are mechanical works of art. I mean, everything about them is, you'd say, wow. At least I did. Yeah, right. That's right. That's what you need. And of course, the amazing part is that what what you see today is probably you know, not exactly what the brothers saw in those days. <laughs> Visualize this. You know, do you think it ever looked like that? Probably not. <laughs> you know, is that bad? No. It's just, but. As I say, you know, it had a, a, a top and open car. It had, you'll notice that the, the creature comforts with a windshield in the back. And I don't know whether you've ever ridden the back seat of one of these cars with a top on it. It is really, really aggressive back there. I mean, well, the wind buffets the hell out of you and you sit back there and you want, and the, I, I, was, I was married to a blonde girl for a long, long time. And she, she used to say, you know, the Thunderbird, the top goes on the Thunderbird, or I don't get inside. Turn the lights on, blah, blah, blah. And, 
and, and this is the key event for that car this day or this year because out of that will come the price of the car. This guy, he's sort of, you know, he's in the free throw line for them. And of course, they're asking him a thousand questions. He's looking for questions. That's the quail. Is this you? This is this is the owner, and it's the lady with the green hat is his wife. And this is his car, and they're judging. And he's he's. This is I talked about. This is exactly what's happening. So they show them all those parts. I'm sorry. They're, they're showing the judges the parts. And well, the judges have a checklist, and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and and they're grading papers. So so when they get done, they're going to get a score, and that score will go to the thing, and then depending on the way, why the score works, how the score that's. You, you get a prize or you don't get a prize. <laughs> and uh, he has won a lot of prizes. Uh -huh. And he's an acquaintance of mine and, and uh, his wife. Uh, in fact, somewhere I have a picture of he and I standing together down in, yeah, let's see, my stall here. So, this is, this is a so I've done this at least once before. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, at least once. <laughs> so anyway, so that's it. And, and, and he's a long time player. He's, a, he's considered a, a, a big player here, meaning he comes every year with at least one car, often more than one. But most of these guys kind of do one car. And of course, everybody knows everybody. This is uh, this is an insider group. So the owners don't start their own cars. The judges have somebody doing it for them, or what I, don't, I can't answer that. I don't know. Okay. I think I thought because I I was involved in a, in a car that was judged some years ago. The owner. My cousin, who owned the car, was asked to start and do this, do this, do this, and uh, so I don't know. But Eric is such a good guy that they would probably know what to say. The big problem, in the big problem in judging is to be sure that every judge gives every car the same treatment. You know, and, and if you've been doing it a long time, you begin to, and you're a first-time guy here, you wonder, I wonder if that's. Is that really happening? Are we really getting the, uh, the brakes? Anyway, so, but this is worth a moment to spend a little time here to kind of get a sense for what's happening because, you know, I mean, this, this car is a, could, would, could, and the difficulty is there's six others just like it. So you're going to get a first place car out of all this. So you, you don't wind up with a first place winner, what you wind up with about 12, 12 really pissed people. <laughs> and, and, and one guy's a winner, or one person is a winner. And, and, and it's particularly bad if you have some particular car that's got some sort of, I don't know, some sort of experience or something that's, been, that's on its roster that everybody else does not. Okay. Sets it apart. And these cars are, the, the, one of the things that's interesting about these cars is they made great horsepower at low RPM. And that doesn't sound like much, except that they, 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 they literally would pull from third gear, which was high gear, top gear. They would, they would pull from a dead stop. The car would just pull from a dead stop slowly. And that's, that, the reason you have a first gear and a second gear is to be able to start. Anyway, that's kind of all that stuff is sort of minutia. Okay, now, okay. Uh, now I need to get, okay gang, okay ladies and gentlemen, I'll come over oh. here. What we're going to see now is foreign, mostly foreign cars that are foreign to most of you, unless you're a foreign car fan, but you're gonna, we're going to see a variety of cars, most of them from Europe, but, and, and they're all, and, and they would be considered to be handmade cars, meaning there was, there might be 12 or 15 of them made, and, and each one of them will be a little different, and some of them are, the subtleties of different reads is, is incredible. For example, there, there's a car over there, this dark blue, and it's got a little roof on the top, and it's a Taube Lago. It's, it's a tiny car inside. I mean, you know, the fat people stay away. I mean, you know, I don't mean to be insulting, folks, but the, our, they, they, they didn't sell in the USA very well, and there's a really good reason. So, anyway, we, and we'll see another one over here. And we have some stories to tell about that, too. But, yeah. 
Yeah, there he's at. That's the... Yeah. That's a somebody. <laughs> your, your job is to remember your name. Anyway. Yeah, well... Haggerty. Okay, could be. I was... I, yeah, that's not Jackson. that. Wasn't that Hank? Barrett Jackson. Oh, oh, okay, right. Oh, that's Barrett Jackson. Yeah, Craig, that's I know Craig Jackson. From, oh, Craig Jackson. Yeah, he, oh, bought, Jackson. he bought a car that I was involved with years ago, a race car. And so we, we, you had a question, and he said, he said, you said this at the show, and I came here to argue with you about it. And I said, absolutely. I said, let me tell you what happened. And he goes, and he goes, well, I guess you're right. <laughs> and so, so that was a that was a room full of three people. <laughs> anyway, anyway, that's another story for another day. Okay, anyway, so we're going to see a collection of cars along here, and I'm, your assignment is to come back and walk along this right. road. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. One of the problems I have is stability. <laughs> I resemble that remark. <laughs> But you see all these little cues, all these little cues in the car that to pull the, the special pieces of chrome. All those pieces had to be made special for that car. And somebody made six or eight of those parts. And, and so that became you know, kind of the cottage industry in Europe. And in England, England especially, they made these, these things. So, you saw, and, 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 and imagine what it's like to own one of the, buy one of these things in a box and then take it home and say, I'm going to spend $350,000 or a million dollars restoring it. And we need to find some pieces. <laughs> and and if, you, if you're lucky, what you've got is a left hand and right hand piece and you're missing the right hand piece. So all you have to do with the left hand piece is copy it only in reverse. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So the artisans, etc. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, yeah, I worked for I worked for a couple of guys who were, were you know, world class racers. Carol Shelby was one, and that name was uh, pretty familiar. And and Dan Gurney was the other. And and, and Dan Gurney was buddy of mine. We were good friends. Uh -huh. Um, Had some good history. Well, yeah, and we, you know, we did a lot of, we, we built a lot of stuff. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's hard to describe what those businesses are like because, you know, it, they're 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's part of the problem. It's sort of like a hobby. And if you can make money at your hobby, why well, that's supposed to be really good. I'm not sure it is, but that's, you know, I, I looked at 10 years of it. And I did it for 10 years. And, and, and so and I don't want to say it was good or bad. It was just different. And, and uh, in, in the case of Shelby, I did, uh, I wound up building a plant, a, a building f to convert Mustangs. We, we built, we changed Mustangs. We made things called GT350s out of them, and it, it mo mostly became known as Shelby Mustangs. And, and my job was to, to build that plant and build those cars. And so, you know, sort of interesting. I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm in Europe. Okay. You know, and buy a coach builder and let's see if we can. There's an F on the little tag. Yeah, well, did you get a book? One of these books? No, you didn't get one. I think they hand them out. Well, if you were smart, you didn't get one because you had to carry it around. And the same thing would exist with a program. But if we look one up. Okay, here, here, here's the kind of story you get out of it. I'm just trying to figure out what that car It says, okay. And this is the story about the car. And it talks about what it was and what it looked like and what it became. And here's the history. 1936, the car was sold to somebody. That's not that car, but that's the story. And these books, these books are, I think, they'll hand out. Oh, if you got a bag, you probably... Uh, oh, shame on you. Okay. 
That's right. Well, that's probably the, the it, it's all up, it's all upside down because you come in, they give you the book, they give you the program, you say I'm not going to carry all this stuff around, and then they, right. and then then you go back, and then somebody like me says, well, you know, if you look at the book, and then you go, and it, and I I got the book but left the program behind because I didn't want to carry the damn program. So so anyway, so but the answer to the question was yes, the books tell a lot about that, and and if we were worth a damn, we'd know all that stuff already. Some some people do. Some docents you get no more. Than, uh, this guy has made a career out of out of knowing all this stuff. But but I'll bet the question you asked me he can. Anyway, anyway. okay. Are we all st still close together and set? Okay. When I come back up, we went to lunch at that. And 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 I, I encourage you to look at the quality of the work. That's the stunning part. Obviously, these cars. This is this is the place in the world where you build the well, bring the quality cars, and that and that's what's here. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Oh yeah. Well, the problem, the the the, the real problem would be the economic trade-offs. In other words, yes, you could, and and how much would it cost to build it? How much could you sell it for? And the answer is, I'm sure you could sell three of them for, for five hundred thousand dollars. But I don't think you could sell. I don't think you could sell thirty of them for for the same amount of money. In other words, for twenty thousand, for a hundred thousand. Oh yeah, yeah well, it's a really attractive car. But the the first thing you'd probably find out is there's no power assist for the top. So, so you got to put the top down. It's a manual top down deal. So well, I'm not so hot about this. And then the next thing your wife says is the steering is really difficult. Is there a way? How about worst power steering when we did? And the answer is well, uh, it wasn't there when they did the car. So you run through all of that. Well, then just send me the body, and I'll I'll get all of that underneath. Yeah, there right, you go. right. That's right. There you go. Make it work. That's right. Okay. Well, keep coming. Keep keep moving. We'll have to. Five years, yeah. Okay. Okay, now, now without, here, let me see if I, I got a test for all you guys. I'm going to assume we've got a cross section of all kinds of folks. Tell me what brand of car that is. BMW. Why do you say that? It says it on the. Oh, yeah, right. Well, the car is a little. Cheers go over here. <laughs> and, and people will read the pages and stuff go over there. But you can tell from the, from the funny shapes and the, and the symbol on the hood, that's a BMW. And that was a BMW car. And, and I would get 328, so I'm going to say it's about a 160 horsepower car. Probably go about 100 miles an hour, maybe 110 max. And that was a, a lightweight car. And a, and a race car. Now, if you got one of those babies upside down with you in it, you know, and you didn't have a seat belt, your chances were pretty slim. So, you know, but but that was the way it was, and this was a 1937 car. So, you know, that's amazing. And and they they built other cars that were similar, looked similar. To this. So, rather than we have the honors of kicking off the um, rather than having our hundred year celebrations after all the late European events this year. And, and most of what you will see here from here on towards the down towards the end is gonna be styles of racing cars. And, and, and various racing cars. And remember that many racing cars had classes. So there was the classes of cars that ran at Le Mans, and at Le Mans they ran 24 hours, and then they had several different classes of car. And typically, the bigger the car, the more powerful it was, etc. So, yeah. And, and, and you see singular models. Some of these cars were raced at with a 24 hour race. And some of them were one-off cars, meaning the group of guys put a team together and they, they brought a car to, and raced it. They had to meet certain qualifications and so forth like that. So what you see is, it starts like this. There's a 19, 1936 HRG. Well, I remember when, when an HRG, a 1941 HRG raced right here at Pebble Beach in, in, in long ago. and. Uh, so and and most people know you guys knew that Pebble Beach as an event started in 1950, and it's been on continuously since then. 
and it's sort of worked its way up in the world now to where most people would say to you that if your car was entered at Pebble Beach, that you'd been you'd entered the number one event. You'd been invited to be at the number one event in the world. There's places in Europe that like to say they are there, but that ain't true. The, the, the 1950 was the, was what Pebble started, and it's been going since I came in 1955. And and we and and it was not like this. Bruce, do you have to be invited to show a car here? Yes, yes, yes. And and if you're if if you get serious about that, you'll find you have suddenly you have friends who call you on the phone that you didn't even know you had, and they will say, "Why don't Mark? Why don't you bring your car?" You know, and, and that's or, or why don't you come and show your car here? And of course, the guy who who the guy with the the, the guy who looks like Churchill, the tall guy with the white mustache, he he's involved in this stuff all up and down the state, and he's been doing it for a lot of years. And, and, and so, yeah, the answer is they will invite you, and it's easy. It's it's easy to get started. You know, it's it's hard to get the pill, but it's easy to get started. Okay. 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 We have. Okay. We now we. Okay, we still got most of us here. Okay, so we're, we're going to see some more racers along here. And we're, I'm going to move you down to the Mercedes-Benz car. The Mercedes-Benz car was a 1952 entree by Mercedes-Benz, their first entry into motor racing after the war. And, and this particular car was a closed car that was the, was the predecessor to a car called the 300 SL. And it's a, it's a little different, but it's that car. Freezing to death? Okay. Well, we, 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 we could we could jog the next uh, few cars. Anyway, anyway, this the, the one behind me, the one behind me, the silver one is is a Mercedes Benz Gull Wing. It was called the Gull Wing Coupe 300 SL, and and they they brought two of those to Le Mans and proceeded to kind of dominate the, the event. And they took them to Mexico and they did the same thing. So what they'd done was they'd found a, a me method to build a very, very effective racing car. This was it. In 1957, 1957, one of their cars crashed at Le Mans and uh, 90 people were killed. And it was a, it, it obviously caused a big shock wave through the whole industry. And so, uh, and Mercedes withdrew from racing completely. And, and they were gone for 20 years, and then they came back. This, but this car was the, sort of the most effective car they ever had, because everywhere they took it, it won. And, and part of the reason it won was it was a lightweight car. And, and the lightweight cars are the, sort of, that's, that's the hot setup. So in order to control racing, the organizers or the sanctioning bodies set limits on how light cars could be. In other words, that Formula One used to be 1,250 pounds. I don't know what it is today, but, but it used to be 1,250 pounds. And the idea was you had to make that car safe. And, and if by forcing you to make it at some weight, well, that's kind of how you made it safe. But the, these cars, the, the Cadillac and, and, the, and the, the strange looking box over there were, were cars that were developed and moved into auto racing. was a famous yacht racer and an heir to a big pile of money and so on and so on. And he spent his money and his efforts developing motor racers and, and, and boats. And he just sort of did everything. And he had a little place. He lived in Palm Beach, Florida. Most of his work was done out of Florida. However, he did own a, he did own a museum in down, in, um, down there at John Wayne Airport in Orange County years ago. They closed it and it's gone. But he had, and, and he... He did that. Well, if you take a look at the, the box, you'll see that it's it was full of what it was an effort by him and his team of guys to make a lightweight car. And and the story is, true or not, I don't know, but the story was in 1952, he went to France and they took a look at the car and they had a they had two of these big sedans or Cadillac Coupe de Ville. And they said, why don't we try to make a body that's lightweight? 
So they got some sheet metal and they cobbed this thing together called the Le Mans, the Monster, and it got and it and it did okay. When I say okay, it was it was it was in it was in contention like in the first five cars for for a great deal of a 24-hour race. Then somebody crashed it. Well, by the time they got it back, they fixed it and they got it back in the race. But by that time, it had fallen to like where it was 20th. Anyway, so that's kind of Cunningham story. And he was a big yacht racer and a big boat uh, race car builder and spent a big pile of money run, building racing cars. And, and was, was a contributor to this kind of thing. So anyway, so that's that's kind of a Briggs Cunningham story and that's a bit about the car. And it, you know, it, 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 it is certainly gets the prize for the ugliest car you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so now it's, yeah, Hordelac. It was actually built, there was a company that built this car. Well, there's, there's a little more to this that meets the eye. And if you look all around, you'll see these funny little buttons on there. And the, the idea was that those are what, that's how they put airplanes on. That's how they put skins on airplanes in World War II. And, and, and so the result was that what they built was a car that they could work on. And, they, and all those pieces came off. And, they, they, and, and a quarter turn on each one of those little buttons with a special tool, like a screw. Well, open that up, and that means that you got every seven or eight things. That meant the panels came off fairly quickly, and they went back on fairly quickly. So you can take the stuff off and work on the car, and then you put it back on again. And, and, and you know, you can argue whether that's a good idea or not, but that's what they did. And, and, and this is the result. And so years later, this car appears in places like this. But it's great that you guys have Was it, did it win? Was it fast? No, it crashed. And it was, it was, it was like in fifth place, and then it crashed. And, and, and I don't know, not a whole lot of stories they've ever written, but it crashed, and then you got it back together, and you got it back out there, and you got it back. Part of the reason they, it, they were able to get it back on the road again was these panels came off, and they were able to fix it. Now, if you get the panels bent very much, well, then it, the car, you can't put the car back together. Right, right. So, so anyway. Maybe, maybe one of them, one of the more significant racing cars of, of, of all time it was, a, it was a D type Jaguar. And this Jaguar built, built they, were, they were building competitive cars, but they, their competitive cars were heavy. And they decided to try to build a lighter weight car. So this was a result of that effort. Some aerodynamics, the car shaped, you know, kind of like a potato, and it goes through the air better, and it had fins to stabilize it and so forth. They were, they, uh, they won at Le Mans eventually, and and they had a team of cars that went around the, the world and, and raced. And they used to race here in Southern California at the races. And uh, they also built a street car that looked like this, and and uh, they were prized, but. They, they were uh, they were hard cars to drive. They shifted hard. I don't know how many how many people own Jaguars, but the Jaguar owners of the world will tell you that they, they were kind of a pain in the neck to drive. They didn't start real well either. No, no, no. Well, and and, and I, I I have a quick story to tell. One of ten thousand stories I have to tell. But they, I was going. I went to SC and I I was going. I worked at night. I had the midnight to eight o'clock morning, and I was going to school one morning from work, and I looked. Looked like I'd been at work, and I was—I had my Chevy, and I'm driving down the street, and there was a guy in a tweed coat down on Exposition Boulevard, and he was standing next to his his Jaguar Roadster, and he was staring at it like this, and I pulled up alongside him, nobody there, you know, like seven o'clock. I leaned, I said, "Won't start." He says, "Won't start." I said, "Does the fuel pump work?" I don't know. What's a fuel pump? You know, that was an extra. <laughs> And I said, and he said, and I leave it, and I just got out of the car, the engine running. I reached out of the back seat, found a pair of pliers in the, in the back of the car, went out, crawled underneath the car, didn't even talk to him, crawled underneath the car, wrapped on the fuel pump twice. I said, go, go, push the button, to try to start it. And he's looking, I said, what? I, 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 I said, tap, 
and tried the fuel pump again. I said, okay, try starting. She threw like that, and the fuel pump worked, it started. I got back in my car and drove off, and it's sort of, it, the look on his face like, who the hell was that? <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. well, you were the savior. Well, yeah, yeah. it's a sort of magic, you know. How come, I just come, come slimy looking character on, on his way to school, and he's, <laughs> Everybody, everybody's he got a savior story. Right? Everybody has a savior story. Well, I, I often thought, you know, my wife, my wife and I raised six kids, and we had four Volkswagen buses among our retinue of vehicles. And I often thought that if the Volkswagen ever quit, which it never did, I was hoped that somebody would do that for her, because because she was never always behind schedule, always trying to catch up. So there was never enough time. So she was like, no time to chit chat, just time to fix it and go. Okay. okay we're now moving along. This is on your left. On your left is, is, is a collection of Ferraris. The, 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 these are the sort of the premier cars that everybody loves and wants to talk about. And you, and you, you probably talk 30 minutes on each one of those cars. And I won't do that. But I will encourage you to go at least look at them and say, I've looked at, oh, that one I've seen before. That, that's, I mean, and, and, and I think this one here represents the early Ferrari look. There's just something about it that sort of looks like. The one behind it, the dark blue one, is a, is a contemporary sort of a 90s version kind of car. And, and the one thing I remember, I just vividly remember it about Ferraris is you get inside of them and you feel like you're in a capsule. They're really kind of small. And Americans are six foot three inch Americans don't get it. They just yeah. don't get it. And, and, and of course, you know, when you when you start spending three or four million dollars on an auto, you somehow think you ought to be able to fit in it no matter what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. Okay. That is beautiful. Yeah. Well, all of these things are, have the red horse the black horse on them. <laughs> Let me see, are we got our, are we getting everybody sorted together along? How are you doing? Are you freezing to death yet? Do you need a coat? You're, oh, you're buttoned up. Okay, good. That's I. I, I well, I you know I didn't want to be a pain, but I did want you know. And this lady's got her zipper up there. I see, you know. And and at Pebble Beach, I think two years ago, it, we had a heat wave, so it was the other way around. Oh, yeah, just around. And I remember people walking around in their their 20-ish clothes, sweating, and they're feeling like this is awful. But anyway. So th this is another Jaguar. This is a C-type Jaguar. There was a Jaguar in 1948. Jaguar brought together a Roadster, XK120, and that became a very prominent car. People like Clark Gable had their picture taken in them, and they they went 132 miles an hour on a speedway in Belgium. This is in 1947 or 8. So this is right after the war. And so Jaguar sort of emerged as a company that came out of the war effort and blah, blah. And so they went off and they tried racing their Jaguar, their 120, and it wasn't very successful. So they, they, they realized, and part of the reason it wasn't very successful was very heavy. So it was a heavy car, and it didn't handle very well, and so forth. So they, built, they decided they wanted to go and make a reputation for them because they somehow felt that they were a racing company. And they, and they thought that image was good. So they built this car called the C-Type. And they put a couple of prominent guys in them, and, and they were successful. They were sort of the emergence of the racing car vision, the racing car of the street car. They were not street cars, they were racing cars. But they brought that image in, and they helped the dealers sell cars. And of course, Jaguar Roadsters and Jaguar Coupes were pretty prominent. Sedans, okay, so you, but the but, but the Jaguar car was heavy. That was the big problem it had with it. So by the time the D-Type, which is the one we looked at, had the fin on the back, by the time that came around, it was the last of their winners, and they, they weren't able to, and to this day, I don't think they're able to build 
winning race cars. That doesn't mean they're bad. They just tried everything, and they keep coming up with heavy cars. So that's my opinion. <laughs> and of course, you can call me on that because nobody from Jaguar will ever call me and say shut up. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, so we're going to look at Ferraris and, and some other racing cars that have been successful. It's crazy. Go ahead. Ferraris were, were successful at, at racing both in the United States and in Europe. And, and they kind of took, they almost took class. That's good cars. Good cars. And these guys, these guys, this particular kind of car, this particular model of car, and if we saw a whole bunch of them, you wouldn't be able to tell models one from model two from model two. They'll look about the same. But this was a very successful car. And this car was a 1959 the version of, the, of that car. So, you know, um, they, they, the, that Jaguar race against that car there, the Ferrari, it, it wasn't close. It just wasn't even close. This one won. This one would win. Well, Ferrari had built a lightweight car. That was the first thing. Yeah, we're not going to start this conversation yeah. in a race car design because. <laughs> No, anyway, okay. I mean, here, across the way is another one. See, and this is another one. Yeah. 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 Bruce needs to take a little break. So I'm going to look around here a little bit. Incredible cars. All together still? So we're going to walk up here with, with live race cars, and they make a lot of noise. And, and so you, what you'll get is a wave my arms. You'll have to listen to me wave my arms. That's about all you can do. Because they just make too damn much noise. Yeah, that's okay. Talk over it. And uh, it just hurts your ears. So uh, Wayne and most most of the docents are big on race cars. Um, I've sort of had my share of race cars, and I don't need any more noise in my ears. But uh, we'll see, and we we'll see them along here. And there's a big, they collect a big crowd. And and there's some of them are, are truly world class race cars. They're, they're Ford GT was a race car that won in 1967. It makes more racket than I believe. Anyway, walk by and we'll see. If you want to follow along, we'll give it a spin. <laughs> Sometimes they stop. So what it says? Subscribe at ft.com and sign up for their free job. <laughs> I'm keeping up with you, man. Okay. I'm here because from the way it looked originally. Originally, it was the most beautiful thing. Now, with that great. Okay, this. Now that, now that nobody's running their engines. 
This particular car is a Porsche, and, and it's, it, it meets the rules, very, very carefully meets the rules no, 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 that were laid down. It. And what you see is you'll notice that the car is, 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 is this wide, and then the body goes out like this, and the back end's got a wing on it, and, uh, and, and, very, and the front end's got a super flat nose on it. And all of those things were designed where somebody laid down design rules and then somebody went back and designed a car to meet exactly those rules. One of, one of the big deals of the time was the size of the tires. We had mammoth great tires on the back of these cars. And if the cars were powered just by rear wheels, well then you could you find yourself with tires like that, 18 inches wide, but it's stuck out of the car, stuck way out of the car. So they didn't do that, and they but they made rules. So and the rules said, okay, well you can put a false fender out there, and, and allowed them to do a fake fender. So what you wound up with is a car with this, and then somebody shaped it outside of it so that it had it some aerodynamics. So what you got was a car that was just a car that was designed inside the rule box, as it were. And so, uh, and downforces and aerodynamics were a big deal. And then they allowed them to use superchargers or turbochargers, which were a uh, way to augment the power. And they, so they wound up with 11 and 12 and 1400 horsepower, four, yeah, 1400 horsepower engines. So they put all that stuff together. And so all these odd looking things were the results of some engineering guys working on the rules and say, okay, we do this. And, and so those rules, and of course, you know, the aerodynamics, when we had wind tunnels, when we didn't have wind tunnels, aerodynamics was difficult to do. You found wind tunnels, and then you found wind tunnels that had more and more capability, and suddenly you found yourself with the capability. And of course, when you had somebody said, we'll turbocharge in, you now found yourself with 300 horsepower engines. You could now get 1,200 horsepower. You know, it took a little doing to fix it, you know, but that was, so you wound up with a car that would go, you know, 100. I have a side question. Yes. Where's the facilities at? <laughs> A good question. I don't have an answer to it, but 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 I'm I'm betting I'm I'm going to bet that that Concourse Cafe over there might be a good place to try. You okay? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Just to the left of the cafe. To the left of the cafe. I see it now. Walk that way, you'll see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You, you two will make you a dose. <laughs> anyway, does that? Does that kind of help? So the, the reason some of these cars are strange looking is because they made rules and the guys did the, said, okay, we got to meet the rules. So we'll meet the rules. So they wound up odd things. And, and, and one of the things was horsepower. They suddenly found themselves with capability to generate three times the horsepower they had last year. And they were able to do that. Turbochargers provided that capability. I don't want to get into turbochargers. And, and, and so they were successful. And of course, what you see is these cars with strange looking things on the outside. Other cars, they just went along. So, and we'll see. Okay. Well, I worked for him in, in, in 64 and 65. And, and then I worked for Gurney in 66 and 70. Yeah, those strange, some of those strange things happened. I'm not sure I was involved in all of them. I bought a couple. Oh, did you? I still have one. Well, look. Well, yes. Okay, this is. We see that. This, this is. Nice. I believe this, this is a. You remember the Ford versus Ferrari? Sure, that's it. Oh, that's awesome. This was the car. I'm jealous. This, this was one of those cars in that, that, in that race. And I want to say that's, if I got my facts straight, I'm not sure I did. One of the cars, what happened in the race was that they, they, first, when Shelby took on the job from Ford in 1964 to build racing cars and, and, and think for the mother company, on his own. And I always gave him the job to get to it in 64. Well, in 65, he went to, to Daytona Beach with, with a bunch of cars and he came in one, two, three, four. And, and then he went to Sebring and he came in two, three, four. And at Sebring, uh, Jim Hall's Chaparral was first. In, in, Jan, in June of, of 65, he went to Le Mans and came in zero. They did nothing. And that's part of that story. 
Well, the next year they went to Le Mans, and they and they, and they and the movie sort of portrayed the fact that Ken Miles drove for hours and hours and hours, and then wound up finishing second. And what happened was that Miles drove the car, and Miles qualified on the pole on the front row at at uh, Le Mans. This car finished qualified kind of way in the back. So it was was about oh about 500 yards behind miles. So the result was that when the when the race took place, the race was measured in distance, not in the first guy to finish. What happened is at the end of 24 hours, they said, okay, the race is now over. So as the cars went through, they logged the, the miles. But it turned out this car had gone farther because miles started on essentially at the start finish line. This car started way in the back, but they added up the miles. So the, the, the 1,200 yards that this car was behind when the race started was added to the race itself. And so he, Miles, won, the, or he, Bruce McLaren, won the race, and Miles came in second. And that was kind of the story. And, it, and, and that's a hard story to explain, and most people look at you like you're demented. But that's essentially <laughs> what it was. The result. Right? Like, yep. They basically set up Miles to lose. Yeah. yeah. Well, the powers that be at Ford wanted a three way yeah. tie, but yeah. then. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I believe you all believe that. that? Yeah. 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 That's okay. I, yeah. It doesn't make any difference. You know, it's a. Uh, I think Leo Baby came out of that book and that movie bad. Yeah. I, I, and so. I uh, think he was more fair. Well, I was there. I, well, I, it was a movie, right? So they got yeah, to create tension. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly the point. The music was somebody else's doing and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, and, you know, I thought those guys did a pretty good job. And and that's a very hard story to tell. Yeah. That's a very The Miles story. slows down and he doesn't win the race. Yeah, right. And he got told to slow down and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I'm. I'm, I'm yeah, right. But phenomenal nonetheless that Ford did well, that. See, the thing I want to point out, part of my only or in the whole thing was I built a facility at the airport and put Shelby. Oh, is that right? That's right. That's, I don't want to even talk about that, but I did that. That's and, cool. And, and so the result was, the, the result of all of that was that in December of 64, Ford Motor Company gave Shelby the job of running their big race program. Yeah. Right? And what happened was in September of 64, they, he then wound up having to convert the cars. He, he conver they converted the cars to, to Shelby and we took them to the airport and so on and so forth. Well, they came in, in, in February in, at Daytona. Anyway, they came in one, two, three, four. Shelby cars finished four. In, and in March at Sebring, they finished two, three, four behind the Chaparral. Yeah. But then they went to Le Mans and the cars failed completely. And then the next year came around and they and, and everybody went to work really hard and they got the cars stuck. So essentially, you know, my view of the thing is is what I just told you. And and, and we and the only thing I can say is when we moved into into uh, 1200, 12 acres in, at the airport, Shelby said to me, What the hell are we gonna do with all this space? And I said, Well we'll find Famous a way to fill words. it up. Yeah. yeah, right. And eventually we did. And the four years they won Le Mans were... Well, that's, that, the only thing I know is I wound up working for Gurney in 67, and in 67, he and AJ won at, the, uh, won at Le Mans. Okay. And with, the, with, with these the other, cars. Yeah, with the yeah. other cars. I want to say it was like four years in a row. Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah, not yeah, a yeah. student of that. Yeah, I didn't yeah. try to keep track of that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Phenomenal undertaking. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's a, it's a okay. See how this We did not come here to talk about football. We did not come here to talk about fashion stuff. We came here to talk about cars. I couldn't figure out what it was. And this is this is the car that Ford Motor Company brought. This is their this is their car. This is the car that AJ AJ Boyd drove. At the and uh, I worked for him. During that period of time, and, and, and we had the Formula One car. We took we took a Formula One car to Europe, and we won it with that. And then, and, and kind of goes on. And on.
heat and burning ones. Participated in nine races and won seven of them and was at the top. He was third. Anyway, so that's kind of the story of the racing cars. So the racing cars kind of go on and on. And there's one racing car that's worth talking about because nobody else will talk about it. Uh -huh. Love that. Okay. Uh, now we're going to get a little, little teeny bit of trivia, but it's, I think it's worthwhile. It, it, at the 24-hour race in Le Mans, they have a, they have a, uh, it's been predominantly dominated by high-powered cars, most of them uh, German or, Fran uh, or Italian and some USA cars. What the French did early on was they made a thing called the Index of Performance, and the Index of Performance was designed to lo give little cars, little powered cars, small powered cars, the opportunity to be competitive and get a prize. And that and the prize was called the Index of Performance. Well, that little blue car over there has a small 1100cc engine, and to those of you that don't speak CC, that's about the size of a small motorcycle engine. And, 11, and, and that engine won in, in the early 60s, won the index of performance at Le Mans. So in, in, in their view, that was just as successful as some of these Ford cars that won. And that was kind of what they, they set up a set of rules so they could win. Their, their rules that they could win by. And is that good? I don't know if it's good or bad. But they, uh, it's great. It's good, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, sure. Okay, now we're going to... I'm, 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 I'm getting screwed up here a little bit. I think I'm, I'm supposed to be someplace else. <laughs> <laughs> and, there are long walk between here and there. Yeah, right. Well, I was looking at my schedule. So, and so I, I got to check and make sure. Well, the guys that, you know, on Wayne Fields, <laughs> Let me do this. Let me say to you guys that if, if you guys will come back later, I will take all of you around and we'll do the other half of it. And that means you have to come back like at 1 o'clock or 1.30. And I will promise to be there at 1.30 at that place where we met. And if you want to do that, uh, you may say, well, I planned it. I, we understand. The hot rods are over there. All the rest of the stuff from here on down, gorgeous, gorgeous cars. Most of them you've never seen before. They're either old cars or they're uh, European cars, and they're they're all worth they're, they're all worth the money just to go see. And 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 I can't do a lot for you except just go ooh ah. So you know, it's it's is that fair? Yeah, that's fair enough. So, so if, if I don't get back, I'm, I'm supposed to be on a docent tour, and so it was it was fun to see all you. Thank you, thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. I'm glad. I'm glad.